kind of just deal with the greeting and the thanksgiving uh, of the church of the um, book today, and then we'll get into the problem of the uh, increased persecution. <coughs> but first, I have my morning joke. This was funny. When I saw this, I laughed and laughed and laughed. Did you know that stores now are making parking spaces for fat guys who like to grill? They're literally reserving parking spaces, not just for handicapped, but for fat guys who like to grill. Here's what the thing looks like. <laughs> Isn't that a fat guy who likes to grill? So they've reserved him a parking space. So that way we can quick get out, go get our barbecue, uh, our charcoal, and get back in and go home for that nice reserved parking space. I like that one. Okay. So let's jump into the text for this morning. Just uh, first four verses of uh, 2 Thessalonians, starting with chapter 1. Paul starts off like he does with most of his epistles. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, we're going to look at that word, and your love of every one of you for, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. So growing abundantly and increasing. Verse 4, therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfast and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. So he's kind of introducing the topic of the persecution that they are going through. Here's my outline. I hope you picked up nice, nice, firm. Hey, we don't need those stinking clipboards that Dan got us. I got some nice, firm... Thing. I got seven points here. I know, I broke it up into little tiny, little tiny chunks, so we'll go through those rather quickly. Who the letter is from, who the letter is to, wish of God's grace and peace on them, wish of God's grace and peace. I know, small lines there, but wish of God's grace and peace on them, verse 2. Point number four, thanksgiving for them, thankfulness for those believers, their growth in faith and love. We're going to look at that. Point number six, Paul boasts about them to others. He boasts about them. And then point number seven, their steadfastness in the face of persecution steadfastness. We talked about that as kind of being the theme last week, the theme of 2 Thessalonians. Okay, <coughs> who is the letter from? Well, just like um, um, most of the epistles, Paul starts out with, you know, I've said this before, when we get a letter, it says, you know, who is to? Dear John. I know, I used to get a lot of Dear John letters, yeah. Dear John, and then all the, bo the body of the letter, and then finally, who it's from, you know, at the end. Well, I like the format they use in biblical times. They start off right away with who it is from, so you know right off who is talking. Paul says here, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Why? Right, that's who it's from. First of all, um, who is this Sylvanus guy? We're, we're going to talk about him uh, in just a minute. And, of course, Timothy. Timothy had been sent to them, spent some time with them, and then Timothy came back to Paul and reported on how they were doing, and Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians off of that report. But, so let's talk about this. This letter is from Sylvanus, of course, is Silas. He joined Paul on the second missionary journey after Paul and Barnabas departed ways over John Mark. We're going to talk about that in a little more detail. Uh, and then Timothy had visited the Thessalonian believers after Paul and Silas had left. He had brought the word about how they were doing. That was the reason for 1 Thessalonians. We don't know who brought the report, 
for 2 Thessalonians, but somebody had come to Paul and said, hey, there's some stuff going on here, and he wrote 2 Thessalonians. Okay, Silvanus. So who was Silas? You know, we know a lot about like Barnabas. Barnabas was a son of encouragement. You remember Barnabas? You've probably heard messages on Barnabas, but Silas. We don't hear a lot about Silas. Um, so let's talk about him. Well, first of all, Paul is interesting. Paul calls him, how was it pronounced? Let me get that. Silvanus. Silvanus. Paul calls him Silvanus in several letters. First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. He mentions Silvanus in um, First Corinthians and Peter. In 1 Peter, we're going to look at that verse, 1 Peter also calls him Silvanus. Well, who is Silvanus? Well, you remember Saul before he got saved, persecuting the Christians. Then he got saved, and for a while yet, he was Saul. Then he went up to Antioch and began to minister among the Gentiles. And then the book of Acts changes his name to Paul. Now, a lot of people think, just like many of the people in the Old Testament, God changed the name of Abram to Abraham. God changed the name of Sarai to Sarah, you know. And many people think, well, God changed. God came down and said to him in a vision, you were called Saul, now you're going to be called Paul. That didn't happen. That isn't why Saul is a Jewish name. Paul began to minister among the Gentiles, and so he began to call himself by a Gentile name. What is the relationship between Saul and Paul? There really isn't any except they sound similar. Okay, they sound similar in the English, they sound similar in the Greek. So Paul picked up a Roman name, Saul picked up a Roman name because he was going to be ministering among the Gentiles. <coughs> Silas was Jewish. Silas, we're going to talk about his background, come out of Jerusalem, went to Antioch, began to minister among Antioch, went on Paul on a second missionary journey. So Paul began among the Gentiles to call him Silvanus, which was a Latin name, a Roman name, because now Silas, a Jew, was ministering among the, among the Gentiles. So that's why they call him Silvanus. Who was Silas? Well, Acts 15, this is important. We don't hear anything about Silas until Acts 15. Acts 15, let me give you a little background. Paul had, Peter had had his vision about the white sheet lowered and what God had called clean, you better not call unclean. Some Jews mistakenly began to preach the gospel among Gentiles up in Antioch and, oh, heaven forbid, some Gentiles got saved. And God began to work among the Gentiles. Barnabas and Paul went up there to see what's going on, and they saw God was working and saving Gentiles. They stayed up there. After a while, Barnabas and Paul went out on the first missionary journey, preaching the gospel into the Gentile world. People got saved. People heard the gospel. They came to know Jesus Christ. Churches were planted. Paul and Barnabas came back to Antioch and reported what was going on. So God is working out here among the Gentiles, and yet down in Jerusalem, they're still debating, wait a minute, wait a minute here. Can Gentiles enter into the kingdom of God of Gentiles, or do they have to be circumcised? Do they have to become Jews first? So that was a big debate going on. So Paul and Barnabas came from Antioch down to Jerusalem, and we have in, in <clears throat> Acts 15 the big Jerusalem council. Peter told them about his uh, vision of the white sheets coming down out of heaven with unclean animals and what God called clean, you better not call unclean. God had told Peter, I'm launching out into the Gentiles. James found a passage in the Old Testament that basically said in the future days, from the Old Testament, in future days, Gentiles are going to be worshiping alongside Jews. James presented that and saying, look, God's going to open up his kingdom to Gentiles. So the Jerusalem council, 
finally came to a decision. I, I think it's kind of funny because God was already doing it. It was just the Jerusalem council finally overcoming their prejudices and accepting what God was doing. But the Jerusalem council finally came to a decision, okay, it is okay for Gentiles to come into God's kingdom as Gentiles. Now, they had a few provisions like drinking of blood around Jews, and there were some other things that they had to be careful about so that they weren't a stumbling block among, for the Jews that were among them. And they wrote this all down in a letter, okay? This was the Jerusalem Council, a very important meeting and a very important letter, and they're going to send this letter. They couldn't just send it by Paul and Barnabas because they were pro-Gentile anyway, they had to find some faithful men to carry this letter up to Antioch to give this letter to the Gentiles. Who did they find? Well, one of them they found was a faithful Jew by the name of Silas. Acts chapter 15, verse 22. Then it seemed good <clears throat> to the apostles and elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas called Barsabas. We don't know anything further about him. And here we are, Silas, leading men among the brothers. All right, you're caught behind enemy lines. You have found out some secrets about what the enemy is going to do, and you need to get word back to your people. You write a letter, you can't go, or they'll, they'll realize that you were a spy. You need to find somebody faithful to send this letter by. You're a sixth grade boy. You just started liking this one girl in your sixth grade class, but you're too shy to talk to her face to face so you write a letter telling her that you like her and you can't give it to her yourself you got to find some faithful person who won't let this letter fall into the wrong hands or you'll be ridiculed by the whole sixth grade you know you got to find somebody who will deliver this letter to becky sue that tells you tells her that you like her you got to find somebody who can do the job. Huh? They found Silas. A fa they knew he was a faithful guy. Now, they took the letter up there. Barsabas and Silas took the letter up to Antioch. When they got up there, Silas saw, wow, God is doing a work here among the Gentiles, and Silas stayed in Antioch. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And he stayed there because God was working there. He never went back down to Jerusalem. So Silas was a faithful man. He was a prophet. He was ministering the word of God. He was selected out of all of the people in Jerusalem to deliver this letter. That should tell you something about his character. <laughs> A second instance we find about Silas is that Paul and Barnabas had gone on the first missionary journey. When they had gone on that first missionary journey, they had taken a young man, Jewish young man, his name was John Mark, and they ran into the occult, they ran into a sorcerer, and they ran into his Gentiles, and this whole world was rough for John, young John Mark to take, and John Mark says, hey, I'm heading back to Jerusalem. And John Mark left them. Now they're going to go on a second missionary journey. They're up in Antioch. They had made the first missionary journey. Jerusalem Council had taken place. And now they're going to go on their second missionary journey. And Barnabas says, okay, I'll go get John Mark and we'll take him with us. And Paul says, uh-uh. And Barnabas says, yeah, we need to take John Mark with us. And Paul says, no, we're not. And Barnabas says, yes, we are. And Paul says, no, we're not. In fact, it says, and there arose a sharp disagreement. Paul and Barnabas disagreed about whether taking John Mark or not. Um, Barnabas took John, um, oh, so 
that they separated from each other, Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. Okay, Paul still wants to go on this second missionary journey, but he has to find a faithful person to take with him. He's thinking, who can I take? No, nah, that guy will bomb out on me. No, nah, he's kind of lazy. No, nah, I don't want to take him. I know who I'll take. But Paul chose, Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. What does that tell you about Silas's character, that Paul chose him to be his partner on the second missionary journey. Okay, we have one more occurrence of Silas. Well, Silas is mentioned in these letters, 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. <coughs> but Peter mentions Silas as well. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12. He's closing the letter. Now, this was 1 Peter, the book of 1 Peter. Let me give you a little background here. This is late in Peter's ministry. Peter had gone up to Rome and is now not in Jerusalem anymore, but is up in Rome. Paul had gone to Rome. Of course, he'd gone the first time at the end of the book of Acts. Paul had been arrested a second time. We don't know if Paul had been martyred yet by the time Peter wrote this, but it was close to that point. Nero became emperor of Rome. Nero was kind of a funny guy. Nero wanted to build some big monuments to himself so that everybody would know who he was. History has rumors that what Nero did was he started fires in the ghetto areas of Rome to clear land so he could build some big monuments. You heard that expression, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Well, um, history kind of implies that Nero started or had them started himself. Well, a whole bunch of homes were lost. A whole bunch of Romans were, were, were burned, were killed by that. And everyone was mad at Nero. So Nero had to find a scapegoat. So Nero says... Oh, it's that new Jewish sect called the Christians. And Nero blamed it on the Christians. And persecution right in Rome, in the capital city of Rome, broke out under Nero. Paul was martyred. Peter was martyred. Obviously, now don't laugh at this statement. Peter wrote this letter before he was martyred, right? <laughs> he had to have done that. But somehow, Silas probably came to Rome to be with Paul in his last days before he was martyred. And Peter says this about him. By Silvanus, oh, we know him as Silas, a faithful brother, there he uses that word of him, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting, declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. In other words, Silas is going to deliver this letter of First Peter to the world. Peter chose Silas to deliver this letter. It seems like whenever there was a big task that needed to be done, people would look to Silas. Silas would care, get it done. Silas was faithful. Silas would, would, would take the letter from the Jewish council. Silas would go with Paul on a second missionary journey. Silas would deliver this letter in the midst of persecution. Silas would deliver this letter of 1 Peter to the world. Silas was a faithful man. We don't know that much about Silas except that these short passages, but it seems in these short passages Silas was a very faithful guy. Who is Timothy? Well, we've talked about Timothy before. It's interesting, John Mark did not go on that second missionary journey. Barnabas took him and sailed to Cyprus, and Paul and Silas took off on the second missionary journey. But Acts 16, Acts 16, <clears throat> right after... Paul and Silas left. They left Antioch, went up to visit some of the churches. They went into Derby and Lystra. And this is what it says about Timothy. 
Paul also came to Derby and Lystra. This is 16, 1 through 3. Okay, right at the beginning of 16, right after they left. So this is right at the beginning, right at the beginning of the second missionary journey. Young John Mark didn't go, so Paul seems to be looking for some young guy to train and disciple as well, just like John Mark was supposed to be on the first missionary journey, but he bombed out on him. Paul also came to Derby and Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. <clears throat> Verse 2, he was, well re- he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. This is Timothy, well spoken of. Hey, Paul. We got this young guy who's really growing in the Lord, really doing well, really coming along. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him and took him and circumcised him because of the Jews that were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And Paul took now, Paul and Silas on their second missionary journey took Timothy with them. So that's why this letter is written, of course, right after this, Paul had his Macedonian call, left from Asia, went over to Philippi, and then the second major city he went to was Thessalonica. Yeah, they knew Timothy from that. So the letter was written from Paul, from Silas, and from Timothy. Okay, cross-reference. This is important about Timothy's character. We see that Silas was a faithful, faithful guy. Notice what Paul says here about Timothy. Philippians chapter 2 (coughs) <coughs> Verses 19 and 20. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by the news of you. Okay? Seems like Paul is always sending Timothy off to do to do things. Whenever Paul had some job to get done, Timothy was there to do it. But notice why Paul sent Timothy. Verse 20. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Isn't that quite a statement for Paul to make about Timothy's character? He says, I'm going to send Timothy to you, Philippians, uh, because he is a guy who will genuinely care for your welfare, your spiritual growth. He will be loving and kind, and he will care for you. Wow, what a team. Paul, Silas, and Timothy. All right, who is this letter to? Well, some of this we can go uh, we can go rather quickly. We know, because I've talked, I've already gone through 1 Thessalonians, and we've talked about the Thessalonian church. To the church of the Thessalonians in God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting. Paul will always say, he doesn't just say, and to the church that's at Thessalonica, you know, or the church that's in, uh, of the Thessalonians. He always adds something. Look at the different epistles. He always adds something more describing them, and that's rather interesting to study. Here he says, they are in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. A little preposition, in. Uh, Who were the Thessalonian believers? Well, we already know about that. We have just finished 1 Thessalonians and talked about who they were. You remember Paul was only with them a short time and had to leave quickly because of persecution. So these believers were quite new in the faith. They were undergoing persecution. We find in chapter 2 there was a false teacher who was claiming that he had a letter from Paul and it really wasn't. So false teachers were giving them wrong doctrine. So Paul writes this letter to help straighten out some of these issues. Paul reminds them. As Paul addresses um, who this letter is to, he reminds these believers that they are in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's a small preposition. But if you go to the book of uh, Ephesians, there is a whole big section about where Paul talks about us as believers being in Jesus Christ and what it means for us to be in Jesus Christ. We have all spiritual blessings, he says in Ephesians, in Jesus Christ. And he's reminding these believers at, at Thessalonica, You are in Jesus Christ. You've been born again. You've been accepted into his body. 
Paul discusses the, all of the blessings that believers have in Christ. I've said that. All right. He wishes God's grace and peace on them. Like he does in many of the letters. Uh, here's the verse. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so he wishes God's grace and peace on them. Peace of God. Let me just give you a couple of cross-references. Paul says to them in the opening letter, I want God's grace on your life. We talked about grace a couple weeks ago. And he says, I want God's peace to be on your life. Let me give you a couple of cross-references. Romans chapter 14, verse 17, Paul says this. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. They were all arguing, oh, can we eat this? Oh, can we drink that? Oh, no, you can't do that. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Paul says it's not about eating and drinking. It's about righteousness and peace and joy. Peace and joy are major important issues in God's kingdom. Second cross-reference, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. In Corinth, they were having all kinds of confusion and all kinds of disruption and all kinds of things going on in their services. There was speaking in tongues and this would happen and these people were prophesying and, and it, it was a mess. Their services were a mess. Paul says, God is not a God of confusion, but he's a God of peace, calmness. He wants to give peace in your life. <clears throat> Paul was thankful for them. I'm moving right along here, folks. I took a long time on Silas here. so Thankful for them. First part of verse 3. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right. He, we come to Thessalonica, I preached, you guys believed, we had to leave. Paul says, I'm so thankful for you. He says that about all the churches that he had planted. He was so thankful that God was using him to bring the kingdom of God out into the Gentile world. He was thankful for those believers. Um, I say this about, about this. Here's a cross-reference. Thankfulness and thankfulness for other believers is very important. Thankfulness is very important. I don't think we realize the importance of thankfulness. Romans chapter 1, after the introduction, and you come down to Romans 1 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation. That's considered kind of the theme verse of the book of Romans. Paul, the rest of the Romans chapter 1, Paul begins to talk about the degeneration of man. Man began to degenerate and became sinful and became more sinful and even yet became more sinful. And God just took his hands off and turned them over to their own sinfulness and their own sinfulness just brought them into more degeneration and more sinfulness. It is a depressing chapter to read. But earlier in that degeneration, how did that degeneration of man start? Verse 21, Paul says this. For although they knew God, this is talking about those generations shortly after Adam and Eve, uh, Cain and Abel, those, those generations, they knew God. They did not honor him as God. Notice this. Or give thanks to him. A lack of... Of th uh, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And if I can summarize the rest of the chapter, the degeneration of man began to go downhill quickly. Where did it start? It started, isn't this interesting? It started with a lack of thankfulness because their hearts were too proud. They didn't want to give thanks to God. They didn't want to recognize God. They didn't want to honor God. They wanted to be proud and honor themselves. And that began the degeneration of man's sinfulness. Thankfulness is very important. For us believers, thankfulness is very important. Without it, we begin to degenerate and spiral down into pride and selfishness and greed. 
we need to be thankful. Paul was thankful for the Thessalonians. Their growth. They were a young church, but they were growing. Paul says in verse 3, he says he's thankful to them because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. They're under persecution. They're a young church. There's no major leader. Paul had to leave them. Timothy was with them for a little while. Then he left. And there they are struggling on their own. But they are growing. God is working. I did a, I did a word study here. Growing abundantly, he said in there. <coughs> it comes from the Greek word hypooxano. Hypooxano. Okay? And that comes from two Greek words. So in English, we got it as two words. The Greeks, they like to stick prepositions on the front of words. The preposition on the front of that word, hyper. Hyper, you know what that means. A hyperactive child is overly active. A hyper, hyper what? We use it different places. Hyper means over and above. Oxano means to grow or to increase. So Paul says they are hyper growing. And he, see, he looks at their love and, or their faith. This, this is about their faith. He looks at their faith and he sees that their faith is, is hyper growing. In fact, I got the definition from Strong. Strong was a Greek scholar, wrote some, we know Strong's exhaustive concordance. Um, but he was a Greek scholar that he wrote back in the 1800s. This is his definition of this word here. Put together, it means increase above ordinary degree, grow exceedingly. That's Strong's definition. They were growing in their faith. They were having hyper growth. <laughs> I like that. I like that word. All right. Um, um, uh, that's a whole nother time. You know, in the, in, the, in the Bible where it says that uh, we are more than conquerors, that's got that hyper on the word for conquerors, which is, which is oh, I just lost it. What's the tennis shoe name? Nike. And so it is, they were hyper Nike. They were more than conquerors. I like that when they use that hyper. They were hyper growing in their faith. Okay, the next one. Their love was increasing. Well, I looked up that word in the original language. Pleonazo. Now, this is Strong's definition. The quotes are around it. To make or be more. To increase. To here, this is he wrote in the 1800s. So this isn't one of those, you know, contemporary terms. He says, to superabound. <laughs> Isn't that a good word? To superabound, abundant, make to increase, have over. Okay? So Strong says that their faith <coughs> was hyper growing and their, light, their love was superabounding. <laughs> they, uh, I like that. Do you think they were growing? <laughs> Paul's using some very strong words here. Their faith and their love were growing. Bamboo. Did you ever hear about bamboo? Bamboo is the fastest growing plant on the planet. Bamboo grows incredibly quickly, which is one of the reasons it is often used to make sustainable, eco-friendly products. Uh, some species, not all species, but some species of bamboo can literally grow 91 centimeters, that's nearly 31 inches, in a day. Yeah, you see those big tall stalks and they're growing, they can grow, they can grow 31 inches in a day. So if you stood, I say here, there, so if you stood there watching it and you watched it long enough, you could literally almost see that thing growing. Well, that's a good example here, I say, of the faith and the love that the Thessalonians had. They had bamboo faith and love. It was growing tremendously. All right, Stephen J. Cole, he is a well-known Bible speaker. 
He's on this site here, Bible.org. Uh, he says this. I, I got a quote here. I liked this quote. I was reading his article on 2 Thessalonians, and I liked this quote, so I took it. I say, he says here, this is a quote from him, there seems to be a shortage of healthy churches in our day. I get emails from people asking if they know of a good church in their city, but often I am hard-pressed to endorse any. I often hear of or read about abusive churches, legalistic churches, dead churches, or shallow churches. Huh? That's the way many of the churches are today. More and more churches that claim to be evangelical are capitulating to the culture on biblical moral standards. So when I hear about healthy, solid churches that preach the gospel and teach God's word, it brings me great joy and hope. Now he says this in introduction. Then he goes on to say about the Thessalonian church. The Apostle Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians a few months after 1 Thessalonians to the church that had come into existence out of a pagan culture about 12 to 18 months before. As you would expect, they were not free from their problems, no church is. He says they were experiencing trials and persecutions, chapter 1. They were confused over some false teaching about the day of the Lord, chapter 2. Some lazy church members were not working and were mooching off those who were. There's chapter 3. There's our outline for 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. He says this, But in spite of the problems, it was a healthy church. They were growing in faith and in love, which we've looked at, and endurance under persecution, which we're going to look at in just a minute. They were a growing church in their faith, in their love, in their outreach, in their steadfastness. They were faithful to the Lord. Paul's boast about them to others. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God. So Paul had, had to leave Thessalonica in a hurry. He traveled several places. Silas and Timothy were separated from Paul, and so they were going different places, and they were using... <coughs> the Thessalonian church as an example. They were boasting about those. Hey, those believers up there in Thessalonica, they are growing. Let me tell you, they're growing like a weed. They're growing like bamboo. Paul would look on the internet and see how fast bamboo was growing, and, and, and he used that as an example. He used the Thessalonians. He says, we boast about you in the churches of God. Uh, here's a cross-reference. He said the same thing kind of in 1 Thessalonians. We preached on that months ago now. He says this, And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction and with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. They became an example for the others. Paul would boast about them to others. Why can't you be like those Thessalonian Christians? I don't remember who it was anymore, but there was an old rock song uh, where the guy was complaining because parents were always saying, why don't you get a haircut and get a real job? Why can't you be like your big brother? Why can't you be like your big brother Bob? You, I don't know if any of you remember what that was. But, but uh, Paul was saying, look at those Thessalonian believers. Why don't you grow like they do? He was boasting about the Thessalonian believers. For, uh, uh, for not also has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. Remember, it was a, on one of the main trading routes in the Roman Empire. So people would pass through and they'd hear about the Christians there in Thessalonica and they'd carry it all over the Roman Empire. Has it ever been said? Here's something for us to evaluate. Has it ever been said? You get on one of Eunice's bus, and there's two people in front of you, and they're talking about the churches in Grand Rapids. Has it ever been said? You're overhearing what they're saying. Hey, you want to see some real Christians? You should see the people at Anchor Community Church. They really show love for each other. They really live out the Christian life. Did you ever hear that on one of your buses at all? You, you tape all of the, or you record all of the conversations that go on. And you're, 
Wow, has this ever been said about us? It was being said about the Thessalonian believers. It should, we should be living our Christian lives in such a way that it is said about us. All right, I got to hurry on. Their steadfastness in the face of persecution. For your steadfastness and faith in all your <coughs> persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring, Paul says. So he was bragging about them because in the midst of persecution, they were still being steadfast. We talked about that last week. That's kind of the, the whole theme of the whole book of 2 Thessalonians. They were steadfast. Steadfastness. Here's the Greek word, hupomone. We've talked about that before. Hupomone comes from two Greek words. Instead of hyper, it comes from the preposition the, the, on the front, hypo. Hypo means under. Hyper means over. Hyper, hy, yeah, let me get my tongue straightened around. Hypo means under. A hypodermic needle goes under the dermis, under the skin. Mone means to remain. Hypo means under. Moneo means to remain. John chapter 15, 16. Christ talks about that we are to remain in him. A very important theological word. So it literally means, it means to remain under pressure. Well, those Thessalonians, they were under pressure. They were going through persecution and they were remaining and they were being faithful. Steadfastness. Here's Strong's again. Steadfastness, constancy, endurance, patience, steadfast waiting for. They were being steadfast. Okay, cross-reference. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Remember before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and there Paul used it of them in 1 Thessalonians, steadfastness of hope. Okay, conclusion. Here we go. Paul wanted them to experience God's grace. God's grace to you. He also wanted them to experience God's peace. Paul was thankful for them because they were growing. They were growing in faith and in love and they were being steadfast. Take this list and compare your life to it. Can steadfastness, can growing in love, can being thankful, can those be applied to your life? Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for uh, this introduction to the book of 2 Thessalonians. Father, I pray that we would be super abounding in our faith and our love and in our steadfastness. Bless your word to our lives, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.